All right. Well, happy Wednesday and welcome to our very first virtual ag tour with Arizona Farm Bureau Ag in the Classroom of the 2024-2025 school year. We're very excited to be here with all of you this morning and we are excited to be here with our very special guest, Sarah Ogilvie, who you will um, be introduced to in just a moment. But as always, I would like to start with a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, we do have all of you guys on mute currently, and we ask that you stay on mute uh, throughout the duration of today's virtual ag tour. If you do have a question at any point in time through today's tour, please drop us a note in the chat and we will pick up your questions from there and pass them along to Sarah, who will be able to answer them for you while we are on here today. So without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and get started. This will last about 40, 45 minutes. If you have to jump off at any time, please feel free to do so. Um, we will post the recording of the virtual tour a little bit later this afternoon. So you can finish out what you missed if you have to jump off for specials or anything else. So again, welcome to our very first virtual ag tour of the 2024-2025 school year. I am Katie Akins with Arizona Farm Bureau Ag in the Classroom, and I'm very excited to turn our time over to our guest, Miss Sarah Ogilvie. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Good morning. I'm good. How are you guys? Well, I think everybody is well and excited to be here. That's great. Uh, I'm so thankful that Katie, you invited me to participate in this. Um, one of the things that um, obviously, I have a lot going on on my plate, but the big part is the pistachios, and there's a lot of, um, we always have a lot of questions about how pistachios are farmed and how they're raised and, and then how we process them. Um, that's, you know, probably about 50% of my time. The rest is devoted to family and our farm here in Benson, and um, yeah, so... I'm excited to be able to spend some time with you guys and uh, tell you more about what we do. So Sarah, for the folks who are maybe here in Maricopa County or other parts of the state, can you give them a town that's close to you in Benson that they might get an idea of where you are located? Yeah, so we are on I-10 and we're close to Tucson. So we are about 30 to 45 minutes east of Tucson on I-10. We're here in Cochise County, and um, the pistachio orchard is in Cochise itself, which is another 30 minutes east of where I live, and that's my dad lives there by the orchards. Now, do your kids love working, um, living on a farm and doing all of the farm kid things, or do you have to twist their arms to help you? Well, of course. Every, there's things on the farm that no one really wants to do. So some things they love. So my oldest daughter, she's 15 and her name's Madison and she loves to drive the side-by-sides and help me with all the irrigation. And then my daughter, Cora, she's nine and she likes more of the animal stuff. And so, yeah, there's things that they both love to do and things that kind of got really drag them along, but, um, they're, they're troopers. They're great. So speaking of Cora and the animals, you guys have a lot of animals on your farm, don't you? Oh, we do. We have chickens and cats and dogs and cattle and horses and sheep. So, yeah. So my oldest daughter, hers, hers is, she loves the chickens. And then Cora, she loves the dogs and the horses. And then we have the cattle, which me and my husband, we enjoy the most. We, um, we have uh, Black Angus, and we do registered cattle that we, um, we do those for breeding purposes. So we sell bulls and heifers to other ranchers who are looking to improve their herds with genetics. When I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but we have some of your horses up there. Do you want to introduce your horses to the group? Yeah, I'm waiting for it to pop up on my screen. But uh, from memory, I think that is Max. And he's 
he's a gelding that we've had and he's super sweet he um anyone can ride him he's he's just kind of a fun little horse that likes to just get out and go and so do you use the horses for um working your cattle there on the farm or do you use them for other things as well yeah, so we use our horses to gather our cattle, um, and also I do dog competitions, and some of those competitions require me being horseback, and so we'll use the horses in an arena aspect and competitions, and my daughters will use them for 4-H or any horse shows that they, they feel like they'd like to be a part of. Now, we have some questions about Spider. How old is Spider? Spider will, he is a year and a half. So he's a, uh, he's getting big. So he's a, uh, he's super friendly. He's actually half draft and he's half quarter horse. And uh, he's really going to be big. He's, he's almost bigger than my horses that are quite a bit older than him. All right. How about introduce us to the dogs? Katie, I'm not seeing what slide you're on. For some reason, mine's still stuck on. It's stuck in 2018, remember? So we've got Tweed, <laughs> Walter, and Baxter, and Paisley up on the screen. Okay, so Tweed, that is my newest dog that I have. And my friend, um, that's out of her, her litter that she had. And she is going to be 10 months. And she's going to be mainly working... Uh, sheep and cattle and I haven't started training her yet like she she goes out and helps me feed and she really really wants to work but I'm waiting till she gets a little bit bigger so <clears throat> we try and time it so they not too little that they get hurt and not too old that they kind of get set in their ways and then there's Walter that is our Dutch hound and he is has one eye. He was playing with the Border Collies a couple years ago and and they nipped him just right here on the side of his eye and it caused, he had to, yeah, the vet had to remove his eye because it just too much trauma there. So he's, he's our indoor dog and he really, he's just a big love muffin. And then what's the other dog? We've got Baxter still... and Paisley. Okay, yeah, so that picture is we went to Tier C for their ag days and we do ag demos. So, and what we do is we do working cattle or sheep and we show our dogs working the livestock. And so we were in Tier C for their ag days and, and uh, yeah, so Baxter, he is actually Paisley's, um, the only puppy I have left out of, out of Paisley. Um, everybody else went to new homes, but I kept Baxter and he is just, he's pretty fun. And his mom Paisley is the one that she's my main working dog and my main showing dog. And, uh, so when I say showing, I mean, like we go to and do competitions and we work cattle and sheep. And so that was, that was fun. Cause my daughter went with me and, uh, like we had groups of kids. There was. I think ages from six all the way up to, I think I had some sixth graders and they got to meet the dogs. And then, you know, we talked about all the different types of dogs and why we use border collies and kind of the natural tendencies of our border collies. And then we were able to do a demonstration in the arena, moving livestock around. So that was, that was a fun day. So tell them a little bit about the sheep that you have at your house. Yeah, so we raise Dorpers and those are black faced Dorpers and they are actually the breed is from South Africa and they are a hair sheep. So um, they should shed out and we're selecting genetics that allow for them to shed out so we don't have to clip them every year and they are a meat sheep. And so they're not raised for wool because obviously they have hair and um, they're very, 
the the sheep we have are very gentle and they're super friendly and um, they're great for working dogs because them being gentle they like to you know they're a lot slower to work and that's the main reason why we have them is for training dogs a lot of people use them you know they're selling them for meat products but for us we're just raising new sheep for training our dogs and that might have been the first time that some of our friends online have heard of hair sheep so most of our students when they think of sheep they're thinking of sheep for mainly for wool and then of course the meat so the hair sheep as you're saying that they shed out that would be like a a horse or a dog that sort of sheds in the summer is that correct yeah that's correct so they will leave um, a little bit of wool on or hair on the top to help uh, protect them from the sun. But they're mainly like the genetics that we're looking for is really low maintenance. So we're not having to have, you know, come in with clippers and, and trim them off. So they, they stay nice and cool in the summertime. Very cool. All right, so now we're looking at some dogs in a in a buggy and uh, uh huh, Cora on the horse. Yeah, so we have a side by side that we use here on the farm. Um, we actually have moved away from flood irrigation, which uses a lot of water, to sprinklers, and they're like little pods, and they're on a line, and we'll use that side by side to move our sprinklers to spots in the field where we want to focus water. And so the dogs love to go on the side by side and they it gets pretty crowded when all the dogs get in there because they they want to be in the front seat with all the all the wind going through their their ears and their hair. And then the other picture is Paisley, my main working dog, and then my daughter Cora on my horse boots. And that was after us processing cattle. So we had just um, given them their vaccines and did their health checks and, kept, and captured their weights. And then we're moving them back out to the pasture so they can go and get their feed. So now we've just got pictures of some more of your heifers and uh, on the ranch there. Oh, okay, so yeah, those heifers we weaned. So we calve out, so when I say calve out, our cows are having their calves in normally December and in January. We try and keep them really close together so our calves are all about the same age. And so we calve out December, January, and then we will wean, which means we take them off their mothers in about the end of September, early October. And that's when we will start, um, we'll get them their IDs, so their individual brands, so we know who's who. And then we start marketing them because our cattle, again, we use them for breeding purposes and their genetics. So we're selecting for uh, calving ease, so cows that can have their calves without any problems. Um, we are also saw, uh, looking for efficient cows, so we don't want our cows super tall, and uh, we don't want them to make a lot of milk, because if you have a lot of milk, they have to eat a lot of grass, and that makes it hard in the southwest because a lot of ranchers don't have a lot of grass and they can't afford to run cattle that are super tall and make a lot of milk because then the cows just are just too skinny and they just, they have a hard time living out in the desert. So that's what we do here on the farm is we, we are breeding cattle for ranchers that they can have cattle that, that thrive. And so this is a group of heifers that we just weaned and you can tell they're not super tall, but they, they look great. They're slicked off and they, they're, um, they're a really nice set of heifers that are I've actually, they're going to their new home later this week. Oh, so very they, cool. Uh, yeah, we so had someone coming in and bought all our heifers. 
So now we're watching a video of the dog working some cattle. Yeah, so this is Paisley. And what I'm doing is me and Paisley are pinning a set of bulls uh, because it's usually just me working cattle by myself because the girls are at school and my husband's at work. I need a dog and it makes life easier that I can just stand in one spot and then my dog she's really natural on getting around cattle and pushing them where i need them to and she just does a really good job being calm and keeping like everybody real rooms. real quiet do the dogs ever get kicked by the cattle yes yes they do uh it's obviously part of working livestock is is some cattle will give your or livestock will give your dog a hard time the the goal is is to be able to move them without anybody getting bit or anybody getting kicked so as you can see she'll stay off that keeps her from getting kicked and they have enough they've been worked enough that they know that they need to move off of the pressure from the dog so the dog moves in and they know they need to turn away and walk walk towards the opposite direction so but it, it, they do get your dogs will get hurt if you if a they don't listen to you or if your cattle are are pretty mean but we try our best to to limit that because you know we don't want our dogs hurt and we don't want our cattle hurt either so we we really try our best to minimize confrontations now, the other picture we're seeing on the screen is a dog laying down. Of course, that dog was not kicked and is not hurt, but is napping. Yeah, that's, that's his name's Pedro. He was my first Border Collie, and oh, he's still here. He's Cora's favorite dog. And you can tell he's pretty tired. He likes to run, and he likes to play in the sprinklers. And that cat with him, that's Bartleby. And... That cat now weighs 15 pounds. He's a big barn cat and they, he's so silly, but he's yeah, doing his job. He's eating the mice for you. Yeah. And he's a snuggler. Look at him snuggling with Pedro. <laughs> Ooh, so we see you have some award-winning dogs. Yeah. So that's Paisley. And that was a, such a fun trial. That was the first time I ever went to Arizona National and that is held in phoenix at the um at the fairgrounds there and that was the first time we've ever been there and i put her in the nursery class and that means your dog has to be a certain age so they could not be over two years old and uh she came in and i was just blown away she won it and i mean she beat dogs from all over the country it was it was such a fun trial and and we're gonna go again we try and go every year and it's at the end of december so if you guys are looking for things to do arizona national is fun you know they got shows going on with sheep and gut pigs and goats and cattle and then we have the the dog trial too i was gonna say more importantly you and paisley will be there and they can stop by and say hi and see you in oh, yeah. action yeah yeah we're we're gonna do both the cattle and the sheep so it's gonna be fun this is the first year we're adding sheep to the trial and so it's gonna be uh, maybe my dorpers there so i may have more than just dogs i may have some sheep there too in the trial very cool okay well i think it is time that we now turn our attention to the pistachios. I know a lot of our friends who are online with us right now are super excited to learn um, from you about the pistachios today. So if you wouldn't mind sort of jumping into that side of what you do. Yeah, so um, we have been in pistachios. When I say we, my dad, as you can see, he's there on the picture. It's my dad, myself, and then my brother, Jason. And my dad bought the pistachio orchard in 2003. And he has self-taught himself. You know, we, we've always ran cattle. The pistachios are something completely new to us. And so my dad's been doing it for 20 years. And uh, 
Yeah, so he has about 38 acres and um, 35, 38 acres. And uh, yeah, it's something that we really enjoy. It's uh, having trees is, is one of the coolest feelings. You go out there when you're changing waters or doing any of your harvesting. It's just a really peaceful environment. And it's um, the pistachio tree is really cool because you know, compared to pecans and a lot of the other nut trees, it's it's a fairly small tree and uh, it's built for the desert. And so it works here perfect in Arizona. Um, and the pistachio tree is kind of funny because it it really doesn't like hot or uh, excuse me, it has to have so many cooling hours within a year. So it's not like they can just be anywhere. So you have to have a certain environment for pistachios. It can't get too cold. It can't get too hot and you have to have, um, yeah, it's my husband calls them the, the what mama bear tree because it's porridge is too hot, porridge is too cold. It's got to be just right. That's funny. And you said that your dad, Richard, bought the orchard, the, the pistachio orchard in 2003. Were the trees already planted at that point or did he plant the trees? Yeah, so these trees were planted um, mid 80s, so 1980s. So these trees, when my dad got them, were already about 20 years old. So he has added smaller, uh, younger trees and planted his own. He's added more to his orchard. And yeah, he kind of constantly, as trees get sick and they have to be pulled out, you need to replant in those spots. So you're constantly adding and, and taking out trees just, just because that's just the life of, there's a life cycle there. And you can see here, um, these are trees you can see right on the tree line where they are grafted. So um, pistachios are super particular on their ground. Um, they don't like to be um, planted in old farm ground because they're highly susceptible to root rot and other diseases. So you see there at the bottom where the bark is a different color that's because that is a different tree that's a native pistachio tree and the native pistachio trees are super hardy they um they can handle a lot more diseases and whatnot and they're also more uh, efficient with their water so what we do is that we'll graft on to the native a producing and so these are Kerman. This is a Kerman variety of pistachio. And those are the ones that produce our pistachios that we harvest. See, so you can see there uh, where the tape is, that's where it's been grafted. You can see the native root and then the pistachio has been grafted and taped so it'll grow together. That is very cool that I think a lot of people don't know. In fact, a lot of our tree crops uh, here in Arizona and through different parts of the country are that way. So grafting is um, a very cool part of science um, that you guys should look into. Yeah. And a lot of people don't know that actually pistachios come off trees. So a lot of people are, oh, is it a bush? Is it a tree? It's like, no, it's a tree. And they're really, they're a really neat little tree. And um, I don't know if you can tell on the on the leaves, but they're super thick and really waxy. So it's kind of a, and they have a citrusy smell. So when you're in the in the orchard, you can have this citrus citrus smell. It's it's such a such a cool tree. And you were talking a bit about, you know, that Arizona is kind of a cool place for them to be because it is warm, which they like, but also has the correct amount of cooling hours. So how does water and pistachios go together? Yeah. So since they are a desert tree, they require quite a bit less water than your other nut trees um, and fruit trees. Um, that picture you could see there was 
my dad messing with his sensor. And so what that does is it's a soil sensor and it regulates and it's monitoring how much uh, moisture is in the ground. And what it does, it'll send that to his computer and it tells my dad when he needs to water based on the stress level of the trees. And we use micro emitters, which is, are those little sprinklers there on the left hand side of the screen. And those put out about three gallons a minute. No, 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 sorry, sorry. Three gallons an hour. So it's super slow. And we have about, we put those sprinklers one between each set of trees. So there'll be, there'll be a tree, there'll be a, there'll be a sprinkler, tree, sprinkler. So it's kind of sand, the sprinklers are sandwiched in between the trees. And you're trying to get the root zone. So we try and do it in the middle between the trees so it hits their root zone and, and really waters down deep. And during the hottest time of the year, we're running those sprinklers for 24 hours once a week. So those trees are, they're getting about, about 72 gallons split between two trees since the sprinklers in the middle, which is really low when you consider a lot of crop needs as far as water go during the hottest time of the year. Okay, now let's talk about the harvest, which is probably the coolest thing to see with pistachios. Yeah, so um, a lot of people don't know this, but pistachios put their nuts on right now. So for in the next, so what we harvest next fall, the are already on the trees now. So when you're harvesting, you're not only shaking last year what what we're harvesting now, but it's also next year's crop. So you got to be pretty gentle on how you do that. So you'll see my brother here on the right hand side. He's on the catcher, and it's got this arm that goes out underneath the equipment my dad's running, which is the shaker. And my dad will grab the tree and gently shake the tree. And then my brother's equipment comes underneath and it catches everything that comes off the tree. And then it goes on this roller and it's got a blower. So it's blowing a lot of the leaves off, but then the nuts drop into um, this wooden, see that wooden crate right there? And that's what we take, then we take the crate from there and we take it to the processor. As you can see, see the pistachios falling in there. But, so then this is, a, this is my dad on the shaker. You can see how it grabs the tree trunk. And my dad has to be super careful when he grabs that because you can't do it on the graft line because that's where the tree is most fragile. So my dad's constantly checking to see where he's grabbing it, making sure like everything's gonna be covered. So when he shakes, the pistachios fall into my brother's catcher. Yeah, and then he's also gotta be super careful on how hard he shakes because you don't wanna damage your tree. Cause like I said, you already have next year's crop on your tree. So you gotta be careful not to damage your tree to harm next year's harvest. Your dad looks so cool on the back of that shaker. Oh, he he's so funny. He he loves it. He he won't share, to be honest. Like they're pretty possessive of of who gets to run what equipment. Um, my brother gets to run the catcher, and then I get the job of picking all the sticks out. <laughs> yeah, they're watching you do that right now. <laughs> yeah, so that's. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get as much debris. So sticks, leaves, anything that shouldn't be in there. Sometimes we'll get a lizard that we got to rescue and put on another tree. And, and you got to make sure that you have your hearing, like hearing protection. Cause I don't know if you can hear the, if you can't hear it is really loud. And you got to have gloves on because those lots of sap. And so your hands will just be black if you don't have gloves on. But yeah, my job is to is to take as much of the sticks and twigs out. And then when that 
when that is full, the box is full, my brother will stop the conveyor, he'll set the box down, and then I come along in a little tractor and I haul off the box and I bring him a new box that he can start filling up again. And we're trying to do this obviously as fast as possible because there's a lot of trees. I mean, we're looking at anywhere from 130 to 150 trees an acre. So you're, you're, you're a moving. With just a three man woman crew. I love it. Yeah. We, uh, we, we enjoy our lunch breaks when it comes. <laughs> so you'll see these pistachios, they grow in bunches on trees. They kind of look like grapes and they grow in bunches. And then as they mature, they'll get less and less pink. So these are still a ways out from maturity, but that's kind of what they look like on the tree. And you can see how, how big the leaves are. They're such a cool, such a cool tree. And a lot of people don't know this, but pistachios actually crack inside that hole. So there's no extra cracking for your mature nuts. Now there are nuts that don't crack when they're in the tree that get harvested, but that the processor, they run them through a machine that actually will crack the shell off. And then those are your, they're called nut meats or kernels. And those, those are used for more commercial, like, um, like baking and um, those uses. But this, this pistachio you see there that's already cracked inside the shell, that's, that's what we're going for. That's the maturity we want to be harvesting at because you get a, a premium for those pistachios. And then now, can you as hit you can really see, when they come Oh, I'm oh, sorry. sorry. Can you hit really quick um so I know we talked about it when I was there at the farm but there was a time where pistachios were kind of always like a a pink color and we're seeing the outside happens to be that pinkish color but at one point the actual shell of the pistachio was also a pink color. Can you explain why that was? Yeah, so uh, we have time restraints on harvesting. Um, if you, we have 12 hours before, when we shake, after it comes off the tree that we need to get it to the processor or else it will stain the shell and it'll stain it that pink kind of off color that's not attractive. So before they kind of were able to tighten up between harvesting and processing, a lot of those shells were being stained. And so what they would do is they would dye all the pistachios that pink red color to, to hide the stain. And so that, that's, a, that's something that they've gone away from um, just because it's, an, it's not necessary anymore. And that's why we are so, so tight on, when we harvest, we take it to the processor that same day just to keep it a nice, clean, white shell. Speaking of processing, you do a little bit of your own as well. Yeah, so after the trees are, we shake them and we take them to the processor. The processor will take the hole off and sort the pistachios and then dry the pistachios. And then they do testing there to make sure that they're acceptable for human consumption. I get them back after they've been dried. And this is my equipment that I have here at my commercial kitchen. This equipment is from Greece. And um, I had to go outside of the United States to get a smaller roaster, which you see the, the one with the glass, that's my roaster. And then the one that looks like a round barrel like that, that's called my mixer. And so what I do is I will put my pistachios in the mixer, add all my seasonings and flavorings. Um, and then it goes from there into my roaster. And then I will do my roasting there. And it's got as you can see in the video, it's got a little agitator in there and it's spinning my pistachios around to keep them from burning. 
And so that way I get a nice uniform roast and my pistachios get perfectly roasted. And that's how long are they in the roaster? So it varies on what I'm doing. I make candied pistachios and they go in quite a bit longer. Um, but my initial roast, which is my salted, I always do two roasts on my flavored and then on my just my salted. It's it's about 10 minutes that they're in there and I can do about 13 pounds at a time. And so and what gave you the idea to take the pistachios and to do this sort of value added of putting the flavors with them. Yeah, so this is my 2020 story. Uh, my, I had been doing medical billing for about 11 years and it was, it, was a, it was a lot of stress in my life. And I decided, well, my dad was like, you know, we should sell our pistachios. And I was like, okay. So I started out with salted and that you can buy them already salted and repackage them. And it was a big hit. People love pistachios. And I was like, well, I really like the flavored ones. That's, that's what I like. And I couldn't find anyone who would sell me flavored pistachios. And so I was like, well, why don't I do my own? And so I started in my kitchen at my home under the cottage food law. And I just started experimenting on what oil to use and what seasonings. And, and I first started with honey. I was thinking, oh, I could do honey and try with honey. And well, honey's sticky and it, it, it won't work well. And so then I had to go through, I think, 10 different oils to figure out that I like using coconut oil. And, and then I had to dial in how long I have to roast and what seasonings work. And, and so I was doing all this in my commercial in my kitchen, and uh, my husband started researching on roasters, and um, and we wanted to get a U.S. roaster. But the thing is, is everything in the U.S. is built for a lot of pounds at the same time. So it's like you're looking at like doing two thousand pounds at one time. And I'm like, I don't, I didn't. Obviously, I'm too small to do that. I I can't. The, the equipment for that's huge. And so we looked and looked and finally we found those roasters and that mixer from Greece. And um, we had it shipped over. It took six months to get that roaster here. It went on a on a shipping vessel and then it went on a train and then, yeah, and then a truck. It was, it was quite the journey to get that. And uh, it allows me to do 13 pounds at a time. And so I can keep my pistachios fresh. I can do different flavors as you know, I don't have to worry about bagging 2000 pounds of pistachios, I can do, you know, 10 pounds, 13 pounds at a time. And so that allows me to do all these different flavors. I think I'm up to about 15 different flavors. And so, and, and that's the cool thing is if someone calls me and they're like, hey, I really like this seasoning, would you make this for me? I'm like, sure, I, 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 I can, I can put that seasoning on pistachios. So I've done. You have a lot of spice ones, right? Yeah. So your um, your chili and lime, your angry lemon, and I can't remember. Do you have a tahini pistachio? Because tahini is like taking over the world, you know. Um. So uh, I kind of more my chili and lime, but that seasoning I actually um I have to get it from Florida. So some my seasonings come from all over. I. Um, like my steakhouse, that's a nice Traeger one. The angry lemon that I developed myself because my cousin, he liked the cayenne and he liked the lemon pepper. He's like, Sarah, you should do them together. And I'm like, oh, okay. So that's, it's just a matter of being creative and, and not afraid of failing. I mean, I haven't found one that doesn't work yet. So it's kind of fun. And I love the experimentation that you get to do and what a cool sort of um, uh, story and um, something for all of us to look to that you thought 
you know what? This would be a cool idea, flavored pistachios, and nobody had it. And so you said, I think I can do it. And you started experimenting yeah. and and look where you are now. So um, if you guys don't know her, her business for the flavored pistachios, which I absolutely love and have some here in my office, is Top Notch Pistachios. So how can people get their hands on those pistachios, Sarah? Yeah, I have a website. And it's topnotchpistachios.com. And uh, you can order all my different flavors. I have different sizes. I also do gift baskets in the Christmas, around the Christmas time. So it's like I put my pistachios and I work with other um, people. I try and focus on local goods. So people who are making cookies and honey and, and putting these items in my baskets. But the big one is the pistachios. Yeah. And if Again, if anybody ever is like, hey, you should try this flavor, I'm always open to trying new flavors. I think uh, the next one I'm going to do is a green chili and lime. Ooh. That's, that's, a, that's a big one that everybody asks for. Except for you'll find some spices are kind of hard to work with, and green chili is one of those. It, it kind of, it gets, as you roast it, the flavor goes away. So you, you kind of got to experiment and be be willing to tinker and try and like well if i up this ingredient and lower this ingredient if i adjust my roasting temperature and my time this and that way it's it's like a huge science experiment and i i never like science to be honest i am more of a history girl so the fact that i spend my time as a mad scientist is it's pretty funny what a twist well, you found something you were passionate about to apply it for. So it made it fun. Yeah. So it's yeah. not like science or learning, right? We don't think yeah. of it that way when we're having fun. Yeah. And if you guys are not in the Benson area, you can still get those top-notch pistachios. If you go through social media, if you send her a message through social media, she gets back to you instantly or through that website, you can order and she actually ships them uh, to you as well. So that is definitely helpful for those of us that aren't there in that area. Well, Sarah, we sure appreciate your time here with us today, teaching us about uh, your family, introducing us to your family and all the things that you do there on your uh, farm with all of your animals and especially there at the orchard with your pistachios, with your dad and brother. Um, we appreciate your time. And uh, I think we all learned a lot. Thank you so much for having me, Katie. It's, uh, it's been fun. All right. Well, we are going to sign off for now, and we will be back in November for a virtual ag tour of an Arizona cotton gin. So all of you who are excited about those Arizona 5Cs, get ready for cotton. See you later.